Welcome to Golf Smarter Mulligans, number 56. I'm Fred Green. Good golf instruction, no matter how old, can be effective. That's why episode number 140 of Golf Smarter from August 2008 covers a topic that affects every single golfer, no matter what their skill level. When you address the ball, does this sound like what's going on in your head? Adjust my posture. Weight on the front foot. Push down on the insides of my feet. feet lined up to the target. Left arm straight. Don't bend the wrist. Keep the wrist straight. Head down. Don't cast. Push down on the ball. Hit the ball first. Big divot. Head down. Follow through. Ah! Our guest is one of our most trusted teachers when it comes to fully integrated game improvement instruction. Jim Waldron of the Balance Point Golf Schools in an episode we call being paralyzed by too many swing thoughts. Welcome back, Jim. Thanks, Fred. Good to be here. And it's great to have you on. Again, it's the Balance Point Golf School, is uh, the schools that you do uh, in Hawaii and up in Portland. I was looking at the website today, and one of the lines that jumped out at me, it says, the Balance Point Integrative Golf Mastery Model is a revolutionary new paradigm that goes far beyond the limitations of the two golf learning models the outer and the inner game models. Mm-hmm. Please explain that. Well, you know, when I, when I did my original research on this and having grown up in the game, it was pretty clear to me from a probably fairly early age, age 10 or so, when I got pretty serious about playing golf, that at that time there was two, I would say, distinct instructional paradigms. There was 95% of golf teachers and golf media and golf books were, it's basically all mechanics, right? Think swing thoughts. Try to make your body or club do X or Y or Z through willpower, effort, and thinking during the two-second duration or actually one-and-a-half-second duration of, of your golf swing, which struck me at the time, even though I was 10 years old, is kind of crazy because I, 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 I didn't think I could control my body or my club with any kind of precision uh, required in one-and-a-half seconds. And, of course, we know from all kinds of scientific reaction time studies now that that, that that insight was correct. We don't have that kind of control. So I think that basic premise is invalid. And then the, the opposite, the other 5% of teachers, uh, and, and I would lump ment- all mental game teachers in there as well, is the so-called new age or inner game model, which is trust your quote-unquote natural swing. In, you know, in the Legend of Bagger Vance book and movie, they call it your original authentic swing. I think that's uh, absolutely wrong. I don't think there is, is such a thing. I think you're, there's no spot on your, in your DNA and your human genome that label golf swing. Just like if you want to take a violin or a piano lesson, you wouldn't have the teacher t- say, just, just trust your natural piano playing technique because there's no such thing, right? <laughs> yeah. So what those teachers are confusing is your innate ability to learn to a high level of skill a swing that over time becomes quote-unquote natural, becomes more of an automatic reactive athletic motion. They're confusing that, that innate talent for learning with, with the actual swing itself. So, uh, so th- that's how I see it. I think both of those models have some good things about them, and they also have some really weak areas. And basically what I did is I eliminated the weak areas and, and stole the good areas of both, and then added some new research from science, both both uh, you know peak performance psychology in terms of sports psychology, stuff from Asian martial arts on the on the mental side, and you know what I would call a more rigorous, more research tested and proven uh, current cutting edge scientific approach, particularly biomechanics, and added that to the mix. And that's that's what we call the integrative golf mastery model. And it basically means it means physical control or so-called mechanical control of body and club motion. It means mental state control, mental focus control, and it means emotional state control as well. So you kind of get all three. Interesting. Well, it's um, along with the questions that I have that I've prepared for today's conversation, I've, I've received questions from some of the listeners, and, and actually this kind of leads into this question that came from Van Brenner of Sparks, Nevada, and he says, what traditional aspects of instruction, in your opinion, is the most damaging to golfers today? That's a great question. Wow. The most damaging. I would say, and I've given this a lot of thought, I would say it's kind of what I referred to earlier in the conversation, which is that, well, basically, swing thoughts don't work. Swing thoughts, the way the average amateur golfer interprets that phrase, do not work. In fact, they not only do not help you get better or swing the club better, they actually make you flinch. You know, if you continue to use swing thoughts, you're going to develop full swing flinches or full swing yips. 
Let's it could define be much that. More destructive than that. Yeah, let, let's define that a little bit. What, yeah. what kind of swing thoughts people have in their heads and what's hurting them? Well, l- let me make something real clear. When a tour pro talks about using swing thoughts, first of all, you've got to realize who you're, who you're dealing You're dealing with a very, very elite athlete, right? Mm-hmm. And they have a completely different approach to the game than the average amateur. And generally, when they say swing thought, they really mean, and I won't say every, time, every case, but probably 90% of the time, they're referring to a swing feel, meaning they have trained their body enough with this, say, this new swing change they're working on. And you can go to lots of interviews with Tiger Woods and Hank Haney and Butch Harmon, and you'll get some of this information. But when Tiger or any of those guys are working on a swing change, they, they basically get fairly quickly on in the, in the initial process of learning and training. They get to a point where they can feel the presence of the swing change in their muscles, and they can feel its absence. And they can go to the range and hit a ball and say, yeah, I didn't have it in that one. And they can hit another ball, oh, I felt it in that one, right? And I want all my amateur players to eventually get to that point. But that's like, that's like Ph.D. level body awareness, right? So they're feeling in their, in their muscles the presence or absence of the new movement pattern they're trying to learn. In other words, they have a sensory feedback system developed in their mind. There's a, there are sensory nerves in their body and there's motor nerves. Motor nerves contract muscles to move bones and joints. And sensory nerves tell your brain what's happening in your body in terms of pain, pressure, temperature, pleasure, and so forth, right? Body movement, uh, gravity, balance, those are all sensory nerves. So they have highly developed sensory nerves to tell their, their body is sort of sending signals to their brain and, their, and eventually their conscious mind as to what is happening in their golf swing. The average person I see, the average amateur golfer, does, has no sensory feedback system whatsoever. And part of the reason they don't have one is they're stuck in their head using so-called swing thoughts, not swing feels, meaning they're, they're, they're experiencing a swing thought as one of two things. They see an internal visual image in their mind, either a still photo type, type of image or a moving image, like, like watching a motion picture, or they hear their own voice reciting a verbal command like, keep your left arm straight, keep your head down, do this with your right knee, do this with your left shoulder. And the assumption is because the brain, the conscious brain, the conscious mind, is issuing verbal commands to various muscles and body parts that the body parts somehow can recognize those verbal commands in fractions of a second during the swing and carry them out. And that literally is, you know, I'm the kid, I'm the kid saying the emperor has no clothes. I mean, that is the foundation of, of traditional golf swing instruction. Go to the range, have your teacher stand there, and have your teacher give you swing thoughts to employ, to employ on the very next swing and then judge the effect of the swing thought based on the ball flight result. And I, I think that's kind of like, uh, you know, a primitive tribe in the African jungle bowing down and, and chanting to the rain gods. Sure, and once in a while it rains when they do that, right? But there's no cause and effect relationship between their chanting and the rain. Sure. And there's no cause and effect relationship between the average person using those two types of swing thoughts and better ball flight results. Absolutely none. Because... When your mind is visualized, when your conscious mind is seeing a picture of what you want your body to do, or even worse, yelling out verbal commands, your body isn't listening to either of those, not, not in the slightest. And there's a ton of scientific research to back up that statement. So where does visualization fit into this? Well, visualization can work. It doesn't work the way people think it does. I mean, it doesn't work mid-swing. I mean, it works when, you're, when, it, when your body is moving it at somewhere between very slow motion, and in our, in our training program, slow motion is 30 seconds from, from start of takeaway to finish. When you're moving that slowly, that's when you can visualize different body, uh, you know, a different way of moving your muscles and joints, or different body movement pattern, and, and your body will then carry it out. Same with, with auditory commands or verbal commands. When you're moving very slowly, then your conscious mind does have control over your muscles and joints. But when you're moving at a high rate of speed in a short interval of time, it's called ballistic motion in biomechanics, you don't have voluntary precision control over your body. In any sport, golf is no exception. It's your subconscious mind that's controlling your body when you're moving at high rates of speed in short, short intervals of time, never your conscious mind, which means you can't voluntarily make a swing change mid-swing. can't be done. Hmm. When you were talking before about looking at Tiger and Hank Haney and, and uh, Butch Harmon, and, and you know that's just a completely different level of expertise and, and feel. Um, on the uh, 
other show that we do golf better with Edwin Watts Golf, uh, we had Rock Ishii, who is the uh, head ball developer for Nike. And he was talking about working with Tiger um, on development of some new golf balls. And he would do blind tests with Tiger with different balls. And he said that he could feel, Tiger was able to feel the difference with every single ball that. that he was Isn't hitting. That amazing? Yeah. I mean, yeah. he would say, he would, he would have him testing. He would say, all right, we're going to test these kind of balls right now. And he would throw a ringer in, in the middle of all that, and Tiger knew exactly which one it was. Yeah, because his hands are so educated. He has such sensitive hands. And that's, that's the main place you develop a sensory feedback system based on feel is in your hands. You've got more nerve endings, more sensory nerve endings from your hands back to your brain than any other part of your body by far. Maybe your tongue, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not even your tongue, no, seriously. It's, been, it's, been all, it's all been mapped out. It's in your hands. So mm. that's why a big part of our instructional system uses the Henry Cotton term and the golfing machine term, educated hands, because it's not the only thing we teach by, by far, but it's certainly one of, the, one of the early things we teach to everybody. And when you have educated hands, you, you're going to start having you know, learning breakthroughs, light bulbs like crazy, and as well as performance breakthroughs. And how can we develop those, those kind of skills and that kind of touch? Well, <clears throat> that's a great question, too. And I guess the answer is, first of all, you've got to realize when you're in the wrong state. When you're in the ineffective state, what I call you know, using swing thoughts, and the term we use is contamination. So when you're contaminated with swing thoughts, you have to have enough self-awareness to realize, oh, I'm indulging in my old thinking swing thoughts habit. I better stop and shift gears. That's number one. Then you can shift into feel mode. We do actual actual um, exercises from NLP, neuro linguistic programming, to teach people how to make those shifts from from visual to to auditory to feel. We call them the three sensory channels. So when you know you're in your auditory channel, or you know you're in your internal visual channel, seeing you know seeing pictures. I'm talking during the swing itself, right? Uh, you got to be able to recognize that and instantly switch over to to feel. And then at least you have the possibility of developing a sensory feedback system. Do you find it easier to teach people who've been playing golf for a while, or, or, or do you have a lot of success with newbies, with virgins, people who've just come into your golf school for the first, saying, I've never held a golf club, but you know, I need to take it up for any number of they're, reasons? They're very rare. The vir- we call them the virgins. It's funny, right. but that's exactly what we call them. But, <laughs> I mean, the whole school calls them the virgins, so it's kind of a, kind of a little razzy, kind of teasy thing that sure. the rest of the group says, but... It's all done in good humor, but yeah, we've had we've had in the last few years we've had three. Uh, most recently, uh, last year we had a gal, uh, a Vietnamese American gal, uh, moved over here when she was a little baby from Vietnam with her parents. No golf in her family background, obviously, and had never played golf, never watched golf on TV. A lot of her friends were playing golf. She was a college student at the time, medical uh, pre med student. And uh, she's planning decided, to have extra they, time on her hands, huh? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but all her friends were playing golf, and they convinced her to, to to come join them. But she thought, well, I don't know how to do. It. I better take a school first. So uh, her her name is Amy Nguyen. She's from Portland, and uh, she came to our school last year on Memorial Day weekend, a four day school. First day was all in the mental game, then three days of full swing instruction. And ten weeks later, she shot eighty one at a course in Corvallis, Oregon, a regulation length golf course from the men's white tees. Oh my God! Did she have good athletic ability when she walked she was in? Average athletic ability. Really? Uh, she shot consistently between that low score that summer of eighty one and ninety. Her average score was around eighty five, eighty six. She told me, and this is from the white tees because she said she was out driving her male college student buddies, who were all who were experienced golfers, from. The ladies' tees, and they insisted that she that she join them on the white tees. Oh, they must have been so. They were. Pissed. She was stopped on the range three times by people asking her, watching her balls, if she was a member of the LPGA. <laughs> partly because she's got a great swing, partly because there's so many Asian gals now on the on the LPGA tour, and okay. she's Asian. And she said, "No, I've only been playing golf for two months." And of course, people laughed and thought they thought that she was totally joking them, but uh, it's true. And she's she has a very good golf swing. Now, admittedly, she practiced uh, 45 minutes to an hour a day at home, primarily doing slow-motion mirror work. And she would go to the driving range every day, six days a week, and, you know, Monday through Saturday, for about an hour. And she would play nine holes pretty much every day. Oh, well, that's a commitment. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And she was, and she was doing pre-med, <laughs> as you can imagine. <laughs> High achiever. Yeah. High achiever. So, yeah, if you're a blank slate, any teacher will tell you this. It's... You know, it's it's much easier when you're dealing with people playing golf for 30 years with lots of bad habits. It's definitely more of a challenge for both the teacher and the student. But 
even those guys still break through to, to much better, you know, uh, much better golf. Hmm. So what is it that you do to break golfers of ingrained swing habits, of, of bad, bad habits that they have? Well, you know, the, that's another great question. I, I think the main thing is to realize we don't actually do anything, with a, with a few exceptions, to try to break the bad habit. We basically say, look, a, a bad habit or a swing flaw that's habitual is just the absence of a positive fundamental. And since the subconscious mind cannot learn to not do something, it can only learn to do, it processes language only in positive terms. Hence the famous George Lakoff NLP term, whatever you do, don't think of a pink elephant. Right? Of course, you can't not think of a pink elephant. Sure. As soon as you see a pink elephant pop into your head, it's that kind of idea. It's like saying, whatever you do, don't hit the ball out of bounds left. And what you actually see is the ball going out of bounds left when you tell yourself to do that on the tea market. So then, of course, it goes out of bounds left, right? Cause oh, yeah, we talk about that all the time here. Yeah. It's like, don't go in the water, don't go in the water. And what are the last three words you hear? Yeah. Go in the water, yeah. go in the water. Well, that's <laughs> the way your brain works. So yeah. you, can't, you can't process, your, your brain, particularly your subconscious, cannot process negative commands. It can only process positive commands. So our whole instruction pro- program is based on positive learning of what we call the laws of the golf swing or the fundamentals of the golf swing and not focusing on swing corrective so much. But having said that, if someone has a really, really bad flaw that's very, very repeatable, we will do, in our school, we spend about 5% of our time, only 5%, working on, on an individual basis with each student on some corrective drills they can do to sort of, uh, you know, it's like uh, uh, Claude Harmon, you know, Butch Harmon's dad, the famous teaching pro, club pro, also a tour player. He said, you know, you want to cure the cancer first. So, if if someone's really got a bad flaw, yeah, you can you can give someone a corrective drill that will at least reduce it by say fifty percent, right? And then when they support that beginnings of of improvement with a, f- a fundamental approach, a more long term approach, it makes the short term corre- swing corrective exercise even more effective. So we actually use both approaches in our system, but it's ninety five percent fundamental based, only five percent swing corrective based. And. And I guess, to me, one of the frustrations, and it's no knock on you, and I'm sure your schools are great, but um, you get intensive uh, instruction when you go to a school, whereby having a teacher weekly for a few months and stuff, um, with the intense instruction like that, you, you learn a lot of great things, but it's so easy to forget them. Yeah, well, here's, here's the good news. If you're playing golf the way I define golf, subconscious mind golf, and we tell people this in our school, and the first day they get, a, they get an email, 50-page email which talks about this. We don't want you to remember it. <laughs> <laughs> we want you to forget it. <laughs> it's, it's designed for your subconscious mind's consumption, not your conscious mind's consumption. So the information, and, you know, we do four-day golf school. We even do an eight-day golf school just on the golf swing. We do it once a year in Hawaii called the Ultimate Swing School. In eight days, think about eight eight-hour days, 64 hours of instruction, right? And you're going to Hawaii on vacation, and you go to, go to exactly. school eight hours like a day. Yeah. In, in all those 64 hours, only two things are designed for conscious mind and conscious mind-only learning. Your aim and alignment procedure, which you cannot do subconsciously. You must consciously aim your club face at the target, align your body lines parallel left. And where you focus your conscious mind, we call it your focal point, during the one-and-a-half-second duration of your golf swing. Those are the only two things, the only two skill areas in golf that you should be doing and learning and training from conscious mind mode. Everything else is designed for subconscious mind learning. So we want you to learn it, train it to where it's a habit, forget about it, don't think about it anymore. And do you have students who, or potential students perhaps, that are, you know, it's like, well, what's with this whole holistic, conscious mind? They're put off by this whole, you know, new age stuff. Or, or how's the buy-in on that, I guess? Yeah. Um, you know, very, well, of course, it, you know, it's no way of telling, I suppose, because they don't call. They don't call the 800 number. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's like, but I would and say, if you're listening right now, not, please call. <laughs> to correct, is that I'm, I'm a big critic of the new age. I, this is not a new age golf school. This is a science-oriented golf school. Uh, and New and, Age has a, a very strong anti-intellectual and anti-science bias. Sure, plus you're on the West Coast and you're white. People yeah. like already, you know, they know. label you immediately. Yeah. Now, if you come to our golf school and listen to some of the conversations, some of the things I say as a coach, some of the things my assistants say, some of the risque humor, some of the put-downs of New Age culture, 
you would walk away thinking that's the most anti new age golf school on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> but having said all that, we we do train the mind. I mean, because you know, I mean, I don't. Think, I mean, I think even conservative Republicans know that they have a subconscious mind. At least some of them do. Watch it. Right. I mean, <laughs> we all kind of know that we have a subconscious mind. I, mean, I don't yeah. think. That, I mean, since Freud, I mean, Freud basically rediscovered it. He called it the unconscious, but it's the same thing. But. Mm-hmm. I think we all know we have a conscious mind, at least two minds. Actually, we have a four-mind system, but I think the average person knows they have a conscious versus a subconscious. They don't know how much the subconscious influences their behavior until they take a golf school like ours, or like Fred's, for example, Fred Shoemaker's school. Then they, then yeah. they learn that they have a much more powerful subconscious than they had ever thought mm-hmm. previously. Uh, but, yeah, we, we try to keep it real pragmatic, real down-to-earth. Uh, we want people to play better golf, and, and you know, I, I would say it's an eclectic golf school because I'll use anything that works with students from any any source. So you share teachers share ideas, and and uh, or or is it considered stealing ideas? How, how do you? Uh, do you... I always I always attribute if if I take something from a book I read or. Uh, uh, or a video or something I see in the golf channel, I attribute. Uh, most golf teachers don't, in my experience. There yeah. is some stealing. It's sort of like comedians. They steal each other's jokes, you know. They're yeah, not... right. Robin Williams is supposedly yeah. the, uh, the worst. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he just makes the jokes funnier. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Uh, there's not a lot. I wish there was more of that. I mean, we, don't, we have this, you know, biannual thing that happens, uh, you know, the PGA Teaching Summit. And there's, some, there's some sharing that goes on there, but there needs to be more of that, in my opinion. More sharing or yeah. more stealing? <laughs> no, more sharing. More sharing, yeah. yeah. Whether it's attributed or not, I think, I think everybody benefits. The more teachers talk and the more they share, I think the more the overall level of knowledge goes up, right? Well, there are so many instructors, I mean, per player. There's got to be more instructors per participant in golf than any other element of life. I, you know, maybe piano teachers. Uh, yeah. I don't know, but... There seems to be so many, and there isn't one rule of thought. There's, you know, everyone's got their own DVD yep. on how to, you know, improve things, and they've got their own school, and they've got, you know, there's so many different rules of thought, um, and they're all convinced that theirs is right. And there's, and it's, and it's always going to be the way, partly because teaching, as you know, is an art, not a science, right? Right. I mean, teaching is mainly about communication, communication. <laughs> Sure. And listening back to the student talking to you, right? Right, right. But there, so I always say teaching is both an art and it's a science. But the problem is in golf instruction until until very recently, the last decade or so, there's been very little science. It's been mostly opinion, mostly subjective opinion. What the teacher feels or thinks happens in his or her swing, or whatever the trendy new current hot swing model is that's going throughout the golf media. Like right now, it's stack and tilt. Two years ago, it was it was uh, Jim Hardy's you know one plane versus two plane swing model. Right, mm-hmm. fifteen years ago it was Jimmy Ballard. Right, forty years ago it was square to square. It's why I quit golf for eleven years. So there's always a trendy swing model that a lot of teaching pros who don't have their own model will latch on to. And you know, there, again, until very recently, and even even I say very recently, even today, still there's not a, a real comprehensive, thorough, rigorous, scientific discipline approach to both researching the golf swing and then teaching it. I mean, the PGA of America is trying to do that. And Rick Martino is the director of instruction. He's, he's, you know, he's really into biomechanics like I am. He's, we're trying to move that way. But there's so many, there's so many you know, individual teachers who don't want to embrace science still. Mm. Want, who want to use what they c- are convinced works, and they don't want to hear about science. And you know, A lot of instructional books, are, if you read them from the standpoint of, say, the rules of logic or even the rules of evidence, like if you were a lawyer, okay, if you make a statement, what's the evidence to back it up? That simple empirical level of science. There isn't even that in most instruction books. I read statements all the time that just are empirically illogical. Hmm. Like, you know, the, the, the classic one that we see all the time is, in logic, it's called the fallacy of the extremes. It's either black or it's white. There's no middle ground. So, like, for example, Jimmy Ballard taught a massive lateral weight shift back in the 80s. He was teaching in response to, in the 60s and 70s, we're back to where we are now with stack and tilt. Don't, don't transfer weight. No lateral weight transfer. Turn in a barrel. Right? Both of those are actually flaws. If you, if you transfer no weight whatsoever, that's a flaw in the golf swing. If you transfer too much weight in the backswing, that's also a flaw. So people, go, people who think overly simplistically, like a lot of golf teachers do, like a lot of golfers do, to their detriment, 
It's all, so the pendulum is always swinging from one extreme to the other, is what I'm saying in, in golf instruction theory. Where in most cases, it's the point right in the middle that's correct. It's one reason I call this balance point. It's the middle ground, like Buddha talked about. You know, Buddha's always talking about avoid the extremes, take the middle path, the middle way, right? Uh, in reality, almost all great ball strikers, with very few exceptions, have some lateral motion on the backswing, but a tiny amount, not a big amount, not none, a little bit of amount, right? And I mean, that's just one example. I can give you a million others, but that's the, that's the fallacy of the extremes, and it's sort of it is a toxic, destructive influence on golf instruction. Oh, boy, but it sells magazines. It sells magazines. Because, see, it's, it's, because think about it. If, if you say, it's all this extreme way, it's all, uh, it's use your arms, swing your arms, don't do anything with your big muscles, or just use your big muscles, don't swing your arms. It's, it's a very simplistic way to try to understand which, what, uh, you know, a, a phenomena that is inherently, in reality, objectively, very complicated. Complicated doesn't sell. It's not marketable. What, what are the three main words you hear in golf marketing in terms of golf instruction for either uh, you know, swing theory or training age? You hear, you hear the word natural all the time, a buzzword, a marketing buzzword. You hear the word easy. Mm-hmm. And you hear the word simple. And, you know, one of our sayings in Balance Point is, is that we say simple golf swings are for simpletons because it isn't simple. Anybody who tells you it's simple, they're either a fool or a liar. Because when you look at it from an objective scientific point of view, like, like you can do, you, you can go online and look at just type in the biomechanics of the golf swing. There are Ph.D. theses on the golf swing out there. And one of the first things you'll discover is it's, it's biomechanically a complex motion. Psychologically, because of all the 28th century illusions, all the optical illusions, your common sense is fed with completely wrong understanding when you look when you watch a good player swing. You actually get common sense basic you know axioms or basic premises that seem to be so obviously true you would never think to question them in a million years. Then you use those common sense axioms in your learning and your training and your practice, and you don't get significantly better because your basic understanding is flawed. Just, to, just because of the sensory illusions, right? Then yet on top of that, all the 80% of the content of traditional instruction, which is scientifically invalid, and now you're practicing the wrong information. Makes it almost impossible for the average person to get better. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned, you kind of dropped in the middle of that, that you said you quit playing for 11 years? I was a real golf nut when I was a kid. I started when I was four. Oh, but when wow. I was 15, I was one of the top junior players in Chicago. I actually played with Bill Murray a lot. Oh, did you really? <laughs> Growing yeah. up? Yeah. In fact, I, was in, I appeared in a, in a play in high school with Bill. <laughs> Bill was, uh, was for a while there. Him and his brother Brian were, were starters at Evanston Golf Club. And um, we were both, we, all of us were caddies. We were, you know, I caddied at Edgewater Golf Club. I think they caddied up at, at uh, I was thinking of Nectar. How much fun was that? Was he nuts? He was nuts back then, yeah. Was that fun? It was fun, yeah. Was a pretty good golfer back then, too. Yeah. But uh, well, I quit really because I wasn't getting better. I got in a really bad slump, and, and part of the reason I got in a slump, well, two reasons. I was focusing on my club head path on the backswing, doing a lot of mirror work, but I was also doing it without a mirror, where just sort of on the driving range. I was, like, watching my club head go back. You know, in Harvey Penick's Little Red Book, he talks about, well, that's what a devastatingly destructive flaw that is, right, to, wa- to watch your club head go back, mm-hmm. try to manipulate it. I got to where I was shooting. I went from shooting in the low 70s consistently to the mid to high 80s within about three months. Partly because I was watching my club head go back, and partly because I was trying to learn from a book, which was then it was the sort of the, the modern, you know, trendy swing theory. A book written by Jim Flick and Dick Altman called Square to Square, which which now has the worst reputation in the history of golf instruction theory among everybody in the industry. <laughs> Wow. In fact, Jim, to his credit, came out about 10 years ago and wrote a letter, to I think it was to Golf Magazine, apologizing to the golfing public for having written the book. He really? screwed so many people up. So, yeah, that was an example of just a bad instructional content. I was doing what it said to do, but I was getting worse, not better. Hmm. So I, I quit, and I started again when I was 26. Yeah, what brought you back? You know, I just think I always loved it. I mean, you know, once you get the the bug, you know, once you get that, once you get hooked, it's. Uh, Tell me about it. There's something about golf on all aspects. I'm just passionately in love with. It. I love playing. It, I love teaching it. I love researching it. I love practicing it. Even today. Even today, I just. I mean, every time I do a lesson or a school, I learn one or more things. I mean, big big light bulbs. Every time I do a practice session by myself, at least one light bulb typically. 
had a huge one just the other day. I mean, it's just it's just an amazing uh, opportunity for for lifelong learning. It really is. All right, and then, and lastly, I want you to to expand on this light bulb concept. What does this mean? Because we're running out of time here. But what do you what does that mean? I call it deep insight. That's capital D, capital I. It, it means an epiphany. It means in anything. It does not have to be golf. When you have a light bulb, a learning breakthrough about some area of skill, it could be music, it could be martial arts, it could be mathematics. You know, Einstein was notorious for this. He would do thought experiments and have a light bulb, right? He discovered this special theory of relativity, having a light bulb about it, right? Uh, it means you have a learning breakthrough at the level of your intuitive mind, or so-called subconscious mind, not just your intellectual mind. And when you have it, your body comes alive and your mind comes alive, and they're, they're both sort of simultaneously in sync with each other, and it feels it's extremely pleasurable. And it's like you know you've got the truth about something. That's a light bulb. And, and with golf, you can do that for a lifetime. For a lifetime. And, then, and we, you know, we structure our schools. That's the main way we structure our school is for our students to have as many and as massive of light bulbs as possible. All right, well, one more time. Why don't you give the... Uh, the the web address so people can go look up your school and, and track you down for some more. Sure. It's uh, www.balancepointgolf.com. Jim Waldron of balancepointgolf.com and the Balance Point Golf Schools. Thanks, buddy. It was great to have you back again. You're always good, good. for a couple of good stories, huh? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to come back again anytime you want, want to have me. Hey, it's our pleasure, and you're here because it's been requested. They want to hear more from you. Thanks, man. 